Previous videos in this series have talked about TDBench the tool, about how to install it, about the command language, and provided a demo of its use. In this video, we're going to talk about how to design a good benchmark and apply TDBench to that project. First, some definitions. A benchmark is a performance comparison against two or more alternatives. It could be a competitive benchmark to choose a new DBMS, or it could be a non-competitive benchmark to compare the performance of the database on-premise versus the cloud, or maybe between the current platform and the next generation platform, or it could be a comparison between different releases of the database or the same database with different system settings. This was one of the original uses of TDBench, and that was to enable a DBA to test before and after various patches were applied to make sure the performance of the system was maintained. A proof of concept is a test of something new. It's generally not a full implementation. There's possibly a new data model, new queries, and some assumptions about the expected workload. Performance is generally a consideration, and it may be competitive or non-competitive across different vendors. Both of these have the same kind of requirements. Definition of vision, scope, and critical success factors. And there's going to be the acquisition of data. You've got to load it and, and run some tests. In this presentation, we're going to talk about both under the term benchmarks, but it does apply to both benchmarks and PLCs. There are opposing forces surrounding a benchmark. On one side, your current database may be out of gas and no longer providing good response time, or maybe the reports are continuously not available when the users need them. The vendor of your current DBMS may be discontinuing that platform, or you may have a new CIO or architect that's convinced that the cloud is going to solve all your problems of data quality and interoperability of data across different subject areas. Of course, the cloud will, will, will solve all those problems, I'm sure. There's a lot of inertia resisting a change since people are comfortable with the current platform and they don't have to get out of their comfort zone to learn or adapt to a new platform. There is going to be effort and cost to convert some applications. And there may be some internal vendor camps within the company that advocate for one platform or over another. Moving to a new platform is going to use personnel that could be building new applications on the existing platform, and then there's the issue of cost. So some heresy from a benchmark analyst. The benchmark is not the only answer because they're expensive, both for the customer and for vendors. There are legal agreements around confidentiality and the use of the data. There's network connections to engineer and personnel costs for exporting the data. You got to move it somewhere. There'll be a platform you got to pay for for the benchmark, especially in the cloud. There'll be personnel costs to configure the benchmark platform and load the data, and again to run and analyze the tests. You've got a lot of different vendors that you're testing with. Multiply the cost times the number of vendors. A benchmark is like a sandcastle. When it's over, the only thing that remains is the PowerPoint slides. Most of the work is throwaway. There are a lot of alternatives to the benchmark. You could select a vendor based on visiting their existing customers and attending their user groups, and then select one that's likely to be meeting your needs, and do a pilot or phase zero to convert something small and see how it works. You could request hands-on access to a vendor demo system and play with generic data. Get creative. Look at alternatives to the benchmark because it's going to be expensive if you go down that path. So what does a benchmark do? It answers some key questions. Like, why are we going to do this? It's going to prove the business and technical rationale for the, for the move. It's going to help answer some questions about the impact of the selection. That could be financial, uh, 
could help answer some of the questions around the value of the new database to increase revenue and reduce cost. It'll tell something about the cost to do the conversion. And hopefully it'll give you an idea that maybe the new application development costs will be less on the new platform versus the current one. And then finally, what the impact is going to be to the support and training. I always tell people to begin designing a benchmark by looking at the ceiling. Or if you're close enough to the window from your cube, look out at the sky. Discuss dreams for the new environment with users and the support people that are involved with the current platform. Attend user group meetings with the, for the vendor. Read professional journals. Read articles on the internet looking for success stories. And then when you're done, write a one-page description of the future state and socialize it among your coworkers. Second step is to get well-grounded in the current environment. I conduct a lot of benchmark workshops and surprised at the number of deer in the headlight responses I get when I ask simple questions like, how many total users do you have? How many by organization? In the past several months, what were your peak workloads and how many users are connected at those times? How many queries in flight? What are the response times needs of the different user groups? How often are those not being met? How much of your workload is now being exported to files and loaded on, onto a different platform because you weren't meeting the needs? How much data do you have, currently have and how much data do you think you're going to have in the next one to three years? The third step is to argue and agree on the success criteria. That's going to be a statement in the form. If the new database does X, Y, and Z, then we'll proceed to acquire. Some examples of business success criteria. The new DBMS may have analytic tools to answer questions that you can't do today. Maybe it'll allow you to analyze data across platforms that aren't currently integrated. It may provide for end-user sandboxes where users can upload their own data and join it to production data. It may have temporal capabilities to answer questions about not just how the customer is currently categorized, but how they were categorized a year ago when you did promotion spending to try to elevate their purchasing to make them the valued customer that they currently are. It may allow for real-time access to transactions. It may have security features that will open up the doors to your customers and suppliers so that they can analyze the data and save your cost to do that analysis. The new platform may provide web access, call center access, and business reporting all on a single platform so that you have a single version of the truth. There may be multiple technical success criteria, better performance to meet SLAs. You probably need to go through and list those out to make sure that those are measured as part of the engagement. The new platform may have less DVMS overhead and may have more information to help manage the system. It may have some workload management that will protect SLAs for certain important workloads. Maybe it's important that you can restore individual objects after they've been deleted or corrupted. Maybe the database needs to enforce constraints like primary key and referential integrity. Maybe, maybe it has to be supported by BI and ETL tools, whereas you don't have that today. And finally, maybe it needs to be able to recover rapidly from a node failure so that you have con near continuous uptime. Only one of them requires you to acquire customer data to the benchmark platform to prove it. And that's around the better performance to meet SLAs. All the rest, can be answered without doing a full benchmark. One of the critical steps is that all the stakeholders, including executives, must approve the success criteria. We often do that in a benchmark workshop. In fact, often we will create the success criteria in a benchmark workshop 
and get buy-in from the, the stakeholders. The stakeholders are the executives that are eventually going to have to sign the check. Business managers whose people are going to be impacted with training and application changes. The architects, the DBAs, operation managers, support managers, network managers, information security. They all need to buy in to the success criteria. The success criteria will end up being the opening and closing slide of the results presentation. In between there, you'll have information showing how each one of the tests answered those critical success factors. It's important to begin the benchmark with the end in mind. So let's think about an example. You have an all-star athlete able to be a winner on the football field. Is it true that they will be a winner on the swim team? Okay, here's the other side of the analogy. If the database that executes five queries faster than others, does that mean that the database is going to support your real complex workload? When designing the benchmark, you want to look at the architectural role of the data warehouse and focus on that. You need to eliminate those things that are not part of the data warehouse so that you can choose one versus another. You can test those other things, especially now with the cloud. I think it is important to test ETL processes and BI tools with the cloud, but separately, you need to test the performance of the data warehouse. Defining the scope is a balancing act. You need to do sufficient data query and update to enable the decision. If you're looking for a representative sample, it's just enough and avoid boiling the ocean because when you do that, it adds up the cost and causes delay in the whole decision process. What I try to do in designing a benchmark is to analyze the prior month or maybe three months looking for a typical day. And I want to look at it based on the number of queries, CPU load, and, and other metrics. The query is relatively simple, you know, looking by hour, looking at the applications, and getting a CPU, I.O., number of steps, and, and the like, so I have some idea what the pattern is. Then I want to go in a little bit deeper on that particular day and take a look at what kind of queries are being executed. In this one benchmark, we found that despite what they said they wanted to have in the benchmark, which was a whole bunch of long-running analytic queries, that over three-quarters of their workload were queries less than one second. Then you want to take a look at the queries in flight profile. The concurrency rule of thumb is that if you've got a 1,000 registered users, you'll have 100 logged on users at any one point in time, and that will result in 10 queries in flight. The 100 logged on users are formulating reports, they're looking at the results, they're drinking coffee, they're making phone calls and doing other things. So the fact they're logged on does not mean that they're all firing queries. I've had in a number of cases where the customer said, well, we've got 1,000 users, so we want to run 1,000 concurrent queries. And that's not likely to be a realistic workload. In this particular case, you can see that the several thousand users produced about uh, somewhat like 20 queries in flight at one time. There are a couple of peaks where there were throttled workloads. Those happen to have been a result of batch processing, releasing large numbers of queries. The analysis query for that is fairly simple. To use a drive table or maybe a real table to give you clicks every, every minute and then go at the query logging and categorize whether queries that were running were either parsing or, or waiting to run or whether they were in flight based on the start time, stop time, first step time, and first response time. The next step 
is select the sessions and tables that are going to be involved in the benchmark. I begin by identifying a few important tables that have got SLAs associated with them, and then I identify the sessions using those tables. It's important to select the queries by session so that BI tools that generate multiple steps with temporary tables between and user sessions that create temporary tables will all have proper context to allow the queries to execute. Next, you need to find out what other tables are being referenced by those sessions. You need to then analyze what tables those sessions brought in. In some cases, they're bringing in large other fact or transaction tables that you don't want to have in the benchmark because they increase the size dramatically. So eliminate the sessions in those, those tables. Then you want to take a look at the session profile that you've selected and compare that against the production profile. And perhaps make an adjustment to drop sessions to get the workload that matches production. You want to look for opportunities to parameterize the queries because that will take a single query and turn it into lots of queries and that can help to minimize the impact of vendor DBMS caching of data. Databases are not read-only, so identify some table maintenance scripts that reference the tables that are in scope, and importantly, build processes to back out those table maintenance so that you can run the tests over and over again with the same conditions. Build scripts to export the tables and the transactions that will be needed by the update processes. And finally, capture the DDL table statistics and importantly, the session run times and the row counts from all of the reporting so that you have something to validate against. So let's think about the test design. Suppose you are designing a test for a sidewalk at lunchtime in Manhattan. If you were trying to design a test, would you do it like the picture on the left or the picture on the right? Well, surprisingly, a lot of benchmarks are designed using the picture on the left. They line up all the queries at the beginning of the test, they kick them off, and they run until the longest running query is complete. So what's the true concurrency? In fact, what you really have is a measurement of the longest query with some noise at the beginning of its execution. Instead, we prefer to use a fixed period simulation with a constant workload. That allows fairly easy measurement of queries per hour, and the concurrency is the same throughout the test. So a standard performance test protocol is starting with a serial test, then five concurrent streams, and given the rule about concurrency, five concurrent streams is the equivalent to 50 logged on users. Then we test at 10, 20, 40, and 80 concurrent streams. Then we'll test the ETL processes serially, and then test the ETL processes with a moderate concurrent query stream, like 20, for example. In one case, I was testing on a fairly small platform under VMware, and so we adjusted the test to be 2, 4, 8, and 16 instead of the larger numbers. There are some design considerations for the fixed period test. You'll want to set the period of the test to be as short as possible, but you want to allow queries to complete. Shorter tests allow you to run more tests per day. If you kill the queries at the end, you can allocate fractional executions based on partial CPU consumed. If you've got some queries in the mix that are dramatically longer, say most of the queries are in the one second to two or three minute range, and you've got a couple of queries that are in the 50 minute or two hour range, you may want to run those 
just in the serial testing, but not as part of the workload testing. Or if you run them as part of the workload testing, don't use their completion count in your metrics. Just use those for creating competing workload. You'll want to use multiple queues to separate the short and long running queries so that you keep a constant mix. If you have workers drawing queries off of a queue, what will happen is the short queries will finish quickly and eventually you'll end up with more and more workers running long queries. By having separate queues, you can maintain a constant mix of short and long queries throughout the test. You'll also want to consider using multiple queues to separate workloads with different SLAs. And again, setting the number of workers per queue so you can approximate the normal ratio of each type of query. Now, there isn't a known limit to the number of TD Bench queues. However, my experience is that it's seldom justified to have more than about five. More often, I have only about three. You're going to want to keep the ratios of workers per queue constant as you double the workload. So at five streams, you'll have one heavy, two reporting, and two tactical. When you move to 10 streams, it's two, four, and four. And at 20 streams, you'll have four heavy, eight reporting, eight tactical. What you expect to see happen is a graph something like on the left. If a platform can parallelize the queries effectively with a average serial CPU in the 20 or 30 percent range, then if you have three of them running, then you're pretty well used up all of your CPU. In practice, with typical SKU and a mix of heavier and lighter queries, CPU saturation generally occurs in the 10 to 20 stream range. Once you get past that point of saturation, that's either CPU or I.O., then every time you double, the number of streams, you would expect the response time to double because you've only got a fixed amount of, of resources to spread across twice as many executing queries. However, the queries completed per hour should remain constant. What you're looking for is to see if the platform starts thrashing and becomes less efficient as you add more and more workload demand. There are other performance measurements you could look at during a benchmark. For example, can you use their workload management to ensure constant CPU or I.O. availability for a selected workload while all the other workloads increase? And a simple test is just to apply the workload management to some target workload at 40 streams and see if you can get that workload's performance to give the same response time as it yielded when there were only five streams. Another test is that when a node failure occurs, what's, what happens to the queries in flight and what happens to response time after the failure? To design that, I, I generally go with a 10-stream test with less than one-minute queries. I let the system run for about five minutes and then kill one node and let the test continue on for 30 minutes. And I'm interested in the response time of before, during, and after the node failure. It's important to remember, focus your measurements on the DBMS platform. You want to do measurements using a query driver without ETL or BI servers or the network load. I believe it is important to understand the impacts of those, so separately test those for basic functionality. And then you'll get a lot better information if you leverage vendor references for actual production experience with BI and ETL tools, as well as the network impacts of a fully tuned and implemented production environment. Step five, getting the data. This one step causes more variation in any benchmark than any other activity. There's currently one going on that is probably added five or six months. I am not going to go into the details in this presentation because it really requires a separate handling in a different video. But I will overview the issues. 
first contracts need to be negotiated between the legal departments around liability for data exposure. You need to get permission from the data owners and then the most costly in time is maybe the IT security people. You'll need to deal with the cleansing of the PII data and any sensitive or secret content. You're going to have to obtain some sort of mechanism to receive the data. And you'll have to build the extracts to produce usable data. For example, if you're outputting delimited data, and if the delimiter appears within a column, it's got to be escaped or else it will look like you've got extra columns in your table. If you've got line ends within a column, they may be taken as the end of input record. Next, you have to worry about getting the data to the target. If you're thinking about the network, it may not be as fast or reliable as, as people say. In one benchmark with the telecommunications company, their telecommunications analysts estimated it would take 27 hours to move the data. In the end, the five terabytes took about 40 days to move. Step seven is building the scripts to load the data and deal with the mistakes that occurred in number five. In a lot of cases, you get to the point of loading the data and you find out things don't work. Now do you go back and re-extract part or all of the data in order to solve the problem? Finally, it's important to validate the row counts between the source system and the target benchmark platform. The next step is adapting the queries for the benchmark. I strongly recommend using a sandbox for this activity because it can save you a lot of expense versus the target benchmark platform. You want to begin by creating empty tables in the sandbox and then converting the scripts. That may involve vendor-specific conversions of SQL. There may be database references to database names that are in production. And if you're going to run those scripts on the production platform, you're going to need to have alias databases so that you're not impacting production data. Any create table statements will need to be create volatile tables so that you can run the same query in different sessions at the same time. Any kind of current date constraints are going to have to be changed to literals that are going to be relative to the data export or else you'll have queries that are producing zero output rows. Strongly recommend adding a comment to each query giving the query name. That enables you to analyze that query execution on the DBMS platform and gives the same name across each of the platforms where you are testing. Third, you're going to want to run all the scripts against empty tables. <laughs> this is the fastest your benchmark is ever going to run. What you're going to find out is that you miss some views or some functions or something that it You'll have to go back and pull up those additional items from production to get a complete working set. Use a query logging of what objects were used during that test to build a cross-reference of queries to tables and columns. You can use this to prioritize your data loading and it's an excellent reference to use when you get to workload tuning. For the testing environment, you're going to want to choose a platform that's got the same latency, bandwidth, and competing traffic between each of the DBMSs that you're trying to evaluate. Running TDBench on Windows will support thousands of queries per hour. Generally, we use Linux when we need to support hundreds of thousands of queries per hour. Space in the client platform for TDBench will be less than 10 gigabytes for all the logs generally. However, if you've got a lot of data that you're loading, that may increase the disk drive size requirements. In some cases, we'll use the database nodes unless there's a lot of OS activity going on, and that would create imbalance between the nodes. Use the TD Bench prepare and parameters to drive high performance transactions. The prepare eliminates the database parsing for each one of the queries. If you've got a large number of queries, that are in the one second range. In your early testing, measure the average seconds between the first response time of a query to the start time of the next query within each session. 
that average will indicate whether or not the think time of the network overhead and query driver and client is going to be impacting the query per hour measurement that you're doing. Set up environment variables and use them in scripts. That'll make it easier to switch scripts between platforms without having to maintain multiple versions. Those scripts can prompt for passwords and adapt password change requirements to avoid storing them on disk. If using different versions of tables, for example, different sizes with or without indexes, create changeover scripts. Then begin each one of your TD Bench scripts with that changeover script to either set the appropriate database size underneath the views or to run an OS script to reset the transaction tables. Ensure that every test with an update script is preceded by an execution of the script to reset the tables. Next, you need to rehearse the benchmark. Begin with the serial test. You want to compare the run times and row counts versus production. The most office th thing that happens on the initial serial test is that you'll have queries that failed, either because of missing objects, maybe access rights, or maybe there was some error in the conversion of the SQL. If row counts don't match, then the extraction of queries may have been at a different time than the snapshot of the production data, so you need to take a look at the date and timestamp constraints within the queries to see if, if that's the cause of the row counts not matching. When performance is out of line, recognize that different platform architectures or software releases may cause you to have to collect some additional statistics because in the current environment, the optimizer made a lucky guess and the more sophisticated optimizer of the current release may make a wrong guess based on the lack of statistics. Look at the CPU consumed during the query execution. So if you've got a query that uses 25% of the CPU, then if you run four of them, that would consume 100%. And if you had eight of them running concurrently, that would be twice as long to execute. That will give you some guidance as to what kind of concurrency it will take to drive the system to saturation. Use the query to table cross-reference from step six to find queries with performance issues that are dependent on the same tables so that you can go in and do some tuning like the distribution key, partitioning, or indexes. Then try a couple of multi-stream workload tests. What you want to look at is the total CPU and the CPU used by each workload or query and compare that to the production data. That may result in you needing to adjust the number of workers, queues, or the assignment of scripts to queues or the duration of the workload tests. You may need to further address performance issues of queries dependent on the same tables. Then finally, run a complete set as practice to ensure that all the scripts work before you get into your formal measurements. Take time to design abbreviations using your test names so they're meaningful and they'll automatically sort into a sequence you're going to be using for reporting. Same goes for the query names. If you have a number on the end of an abbreviation, pad it with zeros so that the alpha sort will also be a numeric sort. If you make a change that has broad impact, like collecting stats, changing a system setting, or applying a patch, use the note command on the first time that happens so you can document that all the subsequent tests have that condition in effect. You can also use it to flag a test that went terribly wrong to explain the problem and so that you don't look at that when you're doing your final analysis. If you direct the outputs of OS commands to the temp directory, you can uncomment the zip command in the tdbench.tdb to cause it to zip up the logs with a name using the run ID into the logs directory. And finally, you can use the host DBMS query logging capability with TD Bench to analyze DBMS CPU, I.O., objects, steps, explains, compute workload, and system. You know, there's almost 2,500 columns of information in the benchmark database, and I'm sure one of them will help you with your performance issues. You then want to execute and measure. The formal execution 
you want to make sure that things are repeatable or else you can't do a valid comparison between your alternatives. That means no competing workload. Whenever you're doing that analysis, make sure that you don't filter out the noise that is the competing workload. Could be that in the middle of your test, somebody gets on to look at the system and, and do some simple tests, which will impact the results that you're trying to report against. If you're testing on a production environment and can't get a fully quiet system, only one which is fairly quiet, then you need to use scientific methods, which means you repeat the tests at least three times. And if there's significant variation between the tests, you have to test a fourth and a fifth until you get consistent results that you can use in your report. You want to ensure that the client network to each DBMS platform is equivalent. You want to run the test the same way each time for each platform. One of the things that comes up in discussion about benchmarks is database caching. It's unavoidable. There's caching at the disk, at the controller level, in the DBMS platform. It's all over the place. And a lot of that is normal in DBMS production usage. However, in benchmarks, you don't have near the breadth of queries, and it's possible for a database to report results which are not characteristic of a normal production environment. However, clearing the cache or doing a restart of the database between each test is also not a realistic simulation of production because of the I.O. and startup activity that occurs when you do that. If you've selected a good variety of queries, especially when you've used parameters to exercise a large amount of data, then the impact of caching is minimized. If your database caches the final query result, then you should seek to get that feature turned off, or you're going to have to increase the query volume to defeat it. The method I use for the most repeatable test results is to start with a serial test to get the cache into a repeatable state, and you want to ignore that test. And then begin with your measured serial test, followed by your measured workload test, at 5, 10, 20, 40, and 80 streams. Leveraging TDBench during the execute and measure, you want to use the note command to mark your final test results. If you've got multiple vendors running tests on their platforms, then instruct them to use the archive vendor name where notes like final, and instruct them to send the output from the TDBench dump vendor name to you. That'll be a zip file with uh, three tables. You can then use the restore vendor name command to bring those files into your copy of TDBench. You can then do reports across the vendors using a union reporting against the H2 database inside TDBench. You want to place log files and other artifacts from OS commands into the temp directory and then uncomment the tdbench.tdb command so that those get zipped up and saved in the logs directory by run ID. This provides proof of what actually happened during the testing. You can use a tdbench sleep command to delay the start of the script until a scheduled maintenance period and then use the SQL and if statements to test to see if the system is actually idle before you begin running the tests. At the end of the benchmark, or maybe at the end of the availability of the current platform or before upgrading it to be a larger platform, you can extract the query logging occurring during the tests, either using the reporting views in the benchmark database or doing your own joins between the test tracking table and the necessary logging tables to pull just those rows that occurred between the start and stop of the, each test. Finally, if you're conducting a benchmark, this is, this is crazy. You know, you're, what you're trying to do is build a data warehouse and integrate data and tools and network and security in a couple of weeks. It normally takes months or years to do. It's both expensive for the vendors and the customers and introduces delays into the decision making. And many of the decision criteria can be evaluated without customer data. 
if you must proceed, then get buy-in on the success criteria from everybody involved in either the recommending or the approval process. Legal and security approvals are critical to getting started. Sooner or later, they've got to be done. Network connectivity, performance, and security are often overlooked, and they, they just cause the most delays. In some cases, months. In one case, almost half a year. Make sure that the tests are an accurate simulation of real production needs. You'll want to limit the test to be sufficient scope to make the decision. To save cost, use a sandbox to validate and prepare materials before involving the expensive target platform. And ensure that the tests are repeatable without the noise of other workload. For more information, go to downloads.teradata.com. There you'll find JDBC drivers and a link to the TD Bench for any database page. On that page, you'll find the current release of the TD Bench software, the current TD Bench user guide, a trifold command reference with all of the commands, instruction videos, and how to get answers to questions, to contribute content, or to report bugs. Thank you.